Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, we come to you from the sanctuary that is on the campus of North Shore Church of Christ. We appreciate your uh, connecting with us. You're great people, beautiful people, and certainly, hopefully, the things that we have taught will help you in your development spiritually and your understanding of the greatest book in the world, the Biblos, the Bible. I'm Terry Atwater, Minister Emeritus at the North Shore Church of Christ. Our minister is uh, Brother Brooks Griffin. We certainly appreciate being able to deliver these this series to you. As you know, we've been dealing with a, a series of lessons on uh, the illnesses within our society, the mental illnesses, the psychological illnesses, uh, some of the lessons that we've had in this series happen to be dealing with the uh, managing the illness uh, of prejudice or racism. Another one was uh, our uh, dealing with and managing impatience. We are an impatient uh, society in the great United States of America. Uh, an additional one that we shared with you was managing uh, discouragement and frustration. We have a lot of people that are just frustrated and, uh, you know, just uh, they're not edified. They're discouraged about everything, pessimistic. Another subject we dealt with is hatred. There's so much hate going on now, certainly between uh, the political parties. If you're not a Democrat, I hate you. If you're not a Republican, I hate you. And, you know, uh, that hatred is it leads to uh, some other sins that uh, we just don't want to allow to happen uh, to us. Another lesson that we dealt with was worry. We're worried about everything. Though we have food on the table, we have changing clothes, we have uh, television in every room, though we walk around with our cell phones, we're still worried about things. Another illness that we have is fear. Uh, we, are, we are a fear. You know, there's two kinds of fear. There's the fear where you respect God, but then there's a fear where you're just afraid of everything, afraid of yourself, afraid of those around you. Uh, of course, that sets up mistrust. So those are some of the illnesses. And then we're going to deal with uh, another illness that we have in our uh, society that I think uh, you notice that the illnesses that we have, uh, all of these can be helped by Jesus. Jesus is the answer. Uh, you, you, you try going to your psychiatrist, and he can only do so much. Uh, you, you, maybe you put more money in your bank account, and that, that only does one or two things. But uh, you get some more clothes. Uh, you travel and take a vacation, call yourself relaxing, but that doesn't really solve the problem. Uh, so uh, we want to deal with another illness that we have, and I call it the... I call this illness the three tragic D's, the letter D, the three tragic D's that occur within uh, the confines of the human species. The three D's. Uh, what are the three D's, the, the, these diseases? Well, one is doubt. We have a lot of doubters now. The other is disbelief. Those who, you can even tell them the truth, and they still disbelieve the truth. Uh, and then another is distrust. Uh, when you distrust, you can't communicate. You can't love somebody that you distrust. So those are the three Ds, doubt, disbelief, and distrust. These, are, these three together make up a, a, a sickness that is so harmful and hurtful to us. And, 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 and really the answer to that is you have to go to the Biblos. The Bible, I think, can supply some answers. But let me uh, uh, continue our text that I want to share with you just to kind of open this up. is uh, uh, We'll just read it for you. You can write it down. By the way, get your pencil and your paper and uh, uh, be ready to receive uh, this information. Uh, in all of our classes. You need pencil, paper, and also uh, uh, your Bible in order to deal with this. Let's go to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 14, and verse number 1. The Gospel of John. That's in the New Testament. You know the Bible 
as, you, as I've said many times, I like to repeat this in case there are new listeners that come our way and that are not necessarily, they know what they know about the Bible, but not familiar with the Bible. It has two covenants. There is the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, or the Old Testament and the New Testament. Obviously, the Old Testament is our informational covenant. Uh, it tells us how Jesus got here and how we got here and how everything else got here. It's the informational covenant, whereas the New Testament is the best covenant. It's a better covenant. That's why it's called new. Old is, provides information. New provides participation. It's new. It's better. Uh, what, makes it be what makes it better? Well, within the confines of obeying the new covenant, uh, we have salvation. We have reconciliation back uh, to the creator. We have uh, we have justification. We have sanctification where we are set apart. So these, these uh, characteristics occur within the confines of the new covenant. And that's where Jesus is prevalent in his ministry on the earth. And, of course, as he ascends back to heaven and leaves his selected apostles, his appointed apostles, those who, an apostle is somebody who was uh, selected directly by Jesus. They saw Jesus. They witnessed him and his work. And at the same time, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what was written. So in the Gospel of John, now, chapter 14, which many of you have read from time to time, just the, fir the very first verse, where Jesus, uh, this, this particular chapter uh, is, is really uh, looking at the, the function that Jesus plays uh, in this whole scheme of redemption. Uh, and verse 1 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Now let me say this. Now a lot of times when people think about heart, they think about the blood pump. Now, this is not dealing with the blood pump. Okay, it's not dealing with this thing that moves the... That, that, that controls the circulatory system in the human body or in the body of animals, etc. This, the, the heart we're talking about is the mind, the mind of man. That, that, and in fact, Solomon said in the old days, uh, Solomon said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's the place where you think. That's where you reason. That's where you make decisions. So now Jesus comes along and he says, let not your mind or your heart be troubled. See, the reason, many times the reason why it's trouble is because we allow it to get troubled, be troubled, because of what we do and what we see and what we hear and what we smell and what we feel and who we are around, and we allow those the circumstance to trouble us. So Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Just believe in God, okay? Believe in God. And actually, when I see the word God here, I see the Godhead. Uh, the Godhead is, com is a composite of God the Father, the Son, Jesus, and, of course, the Holy Spirit. That makes up the Godhead. So in a, in the Godhead is in agreement. The Godhead is, is, is uniquely, they uniquely work together. Uh, they are not opposed one to the other. They have rolled, R-O-L-E, within uh, this whole uh, uh, kingdom the kingdom of, of heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So what Christ is saying, if you believe in God the Father, you also believe in me. And obviously, it is inferred that you believe in the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit communicates what God says. The Holy Spirit communicates what Christ says. All right? So all of that <coughs> comes, all of them, all of those, those, those entities within the Godhead work together. All right? So that, that, that's, that's one part of our text. The other part of our text is the book of Psalms. So let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment. Back in the Old Testament, let's, let's just read that one right quick, and, and then we, we will uh, proceed with our study for this particular lesson, the tragic three Ds. All right. In Psalms chapter uh, 5, Psalms chapter 5, Two verses, verses 11 
and 12, verses 11 and 12. The psalmist uh, is, is praying. Uh, it's kind of like a morning prayer, actually. And uh, here's what he says in verse number 11. But let, okay, you got that, class? But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. So if we're going to put our trust anywhere, we've got to put it in the Godhead, okay? And that's what the psalmist says, put your trust in thee, rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou, why should we shout for joy? Because thou defendest them. See, we, you know, every human being, I don't care who you are and what you believe, at some point you're going to, you need God to defend you. At some point, you're going to need God. You're going to need the Godhead. Let's put it this way. The God, I like to use the term Godhead so we don't leave Christ out, nor do we leave the Holy Spirit out. You need the Godhead to defend you. Your, your, your keys that you lock up your house or that you lock your car with, there's going to be a time where they won't defend you. Uh, your dog, you may have a, a watchdog, a dog, or something, a Doberman Pinscher, whatever you got. Your dog cannot defend you. There are times that you, so some of you might be, uh, you know, you, you, you might uh, be rich enough to have a security guard. There are times that your security guard can't defend you. Uh, maybe you're the kind of person that maybe you just stay up all night and watch yourself. There are times you cannot even defend yourself. All right? So the psalmist says, but let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Now, here is what he's really saying, that loves the authority that you carry. When you love the name of the, the God here, when you love God the Father, when you love the Son, Jesus, when you love the Holy Spirit, uh, you, you're loving the God here, and, and that authority that they carry uh, is, is it makes it joyful and causes you to relax in your spirit. Then verse 12, he says, For thou, Lord, and that's, that's, that's capital L now, will bless the righteous. All right, when you're righteous now. now notice, notice what I said, righteous. I didn't say right. See, a lot of times we want to mix right and right. You can be right and not righteous. You, you, you can be right as far as man's law, but not righteous as far as the Lord's law. But thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. Will thou compass him as with a shield? In other words, the Lord puts a shield of protection around us. In other words, in fact, the Lord is so powerful, is so omniscient, that he knows what's going to impact you before you ever know yourself. The Lord knows what your tomorrow looks like today. The Lord, the Lord can retrieve your yesterday when you've already forgotten about yesterday. That's how awesome the Lord is. All right, so in managing these three tragic deeds, that's doubt, that's disbelief, and distrust, there is something that is foundational about these three deeds. And what's foundational, Atwater? All right, write this down. Number one, when you have d doubt, disbelief, and distrust, that is a foundation of fear. See, doubt causes fear. Disbelief causes fear. Distrust causes fear. And many times the fear that we have is unnecessary. It's unnecessary, but because we have allowed doubt to creep in, we have fear. Also, these, uh, the, these three Ds, they, they, they set up anxiety or worry. Many of our worries is because of doubt. We doubt what the weather is going to be tomorrow. So we start where you know, here it is today, the ground is dry, it might be cloudy, but the ground is dry. We worried about, you know, are we going to get... One inch of snow, or we're going to get six inches of snow. So we worry about tomorrow instead of living today. Because you might not even see tomorrow, so anxiety sets up because of this. Also, uh, something else, it, it, 
These three D's are foundational of, and that is grief and gloom. Some people are just gloom. They're never positive about anything. They, even when they smile, they look gloomy. They look, they look uh, like they're grief-stricken. Even you can give them a gift, and they, uh, thank you for this gift. I hope I can enjoy it. Good goodness gracious. They didn't have to, you did not have to even be given the gift, okay? So, so grief and gloom. So fear, anxiety, grief, and gloom are the foundational uh, results of the three Ds of doubt, disbelief, and distrust. All right, then, obviously, at the beginning of this particular study, then what's the solution? What's the solution to doubt? What's the solution to disbelief? What's the solution to distrust? The Apostle Paul. I, I, I have to always, when I mention Paul, because I know that there are people in our world that teach that Paul was a rebel rouser and that Paul is someone that you can question and they, they get on Paul see Paul m wrote most of the New Covenant he wrote about 13 books in the New Covenant he wrote everything he wrote Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians uh, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians he wrote Titus, Philemon, Hebrew, and, and Hebrews. Paul wrote all of those books. Uh, and so Paul many times is questioned because he's not Jesus. I've heard people say, I believe Jesus, but I don't believe Paul. Well, let me share something with you. Everything that Paul recorded or wrote, he was inspired by Jesus. He didn't write out of his own philosophy. He didn't write out of his own opinion, but he wrote what the Holy Spirit inspired him to write. That's why we say the Scripture is, is uh, an inspired word of the Godhead, all right? And what Paul wrote was inspired. And Paul wrote, so what's the solution to doubt, disbelief, and distrust. Paul wrote in the book, in his first book, the first book that he wrote that, that's listed in the New Testament is Romans. Chapter 10, verse 17, which says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what, what, what's the answer to doubt? You need faith. But let me use some specificity here. Not just man-made faith, not just earthly faith, but you need that heavenly faith, that New Testament faith that Christ, that God, and that the Holy Spirit offers. And how do you get that faith? By the Word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word. You, 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 don't, you don't get it by what somebody else experienced and what they tell you, what your mama said and your grandmama. Some people say, I got to, my grandmother told me. No, but just because your grandmother, your grandmother only shared with you what she knows, okay? Your grandfather, your grandfather, your, your, your father. You know, that, that, that faith is earthly. The faith that I'm talking about is the faith that originates from the portals of glory or heaven. So, as Paul said, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, or the God here. Now, there is a result when the faith that the Bible, the New Testament offers, when that faith is gone, when that faith is missing. Now listen to me, class. I'm trying to, I'm trying to help you and get you to a point where you'll want to just obey Jesus and do what he says and not try to question it. You know, th this, this is, uh, for instance, we have right now the Constitution of the United States of America. And for the first time, every time somebody goes to the Constitution and try to 
implement and enforce the Constitution. You got somebody that wants to file a lawsuit, an appeal, and, and they want to read into it what's not there. Our former president, he was an insurrectionist. He, he contributed to ins anybody that contributed to insurrection. They are not worthy to run uh, run for an office in the United States of America, period. They're not run definitely not worthy to run in a federal office, that's for sure. And they shouldn't even be running in a state office, okay? Because they are insurrectionists. They are not for the unity of diversity and the unity of, uh, of uh, equity and the unity of inclusion. They're not, they're not worthy to be, uh, uh, co co to be participants in the de democracy. They, they, they want something like an autocracy or a dictatorship. So consequently, uh, they, they, they do not have uh, the, the faith that the New Testament suggests, all right? But when the faith that Christ offers, the faith that God offers, and the faith that the Holy Spirit offers, when that's gone, let me tell you what happens. I'm going to give you five things that happen when that faith is gone. The result of, I guess you might say, the result of faithlessness. The result of faithlessness. When you don't have the New Testament faith. You know, you know, you know, you notice in my teaching, I emphasize New Testament faith. I emphasize New Testament Christian. Because we have people out there that call themselves Christian. In fact, they call themselves Christian nationalists. There's no such thing as a Christian nationalist. And furthermore, what they teach and what they believe, white supremacy will not work with New Testament Christianity. I'm not going to deal with that today. I dealt with that when I did the lesson, dealt with the lesson of managing prejudice or racism. So I'm not going to get into that now. But let me give you five things that when this New Testament faith is gone. Number one, the human thinker loses great thought. When that faith of Christ is gone, your thinking, you lose great thought, and your thought becomes petty. Your thought becomes fictitious. Your thought becomes uh, imaginary. You remember when God uh, built, had Noah to build an ark? The reason why he built the ark, because the imagination of man had become so wicked. Imagine, you can imagine things that don't even exist, all right? So number one, your thinking loses great thought, okay? Let me give you number two. The human worker loses his greatest motive. In other words, when you lose your motive for working, you don't work with meaning. In other words, you, you take a football team. I, I, think, I think that's a problem with the Bears. They, 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 they don't, they, they've lost that motive uh, for really working to win. You lose the spirit of winning. When you lose so much, you think losing becomes a part of your psyche. The same is true in life. When you, when you don't work, you fail. See, the one way to not fail is to work. Work constructively. Work your plan and plan your work. You have to do that, all right? But when you lose the motive, that's the motivation to work, then uh, you got trouble on your hands. All right, let me give you a third area when faith is gone, when the faith is gone. The sinner loses his redemptive source. In other words, didn't I tell you that the New Testament uh, has salvation, it has reconciliation, it has redemption? That's where you get redemption, is in Christ. But when you lose the faith, then the redemptive source is gone. And you cannot be redeemed. You, you, you just cannot be redeemed until you, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So if you don't believe, or if you don't have faith, you can't even, even, even you can't be saved. All right. So so keep that in mind. 
All right, let me give you a fourth area. When you lose that faith, that New Testament faith in Christ, uh, the human sufferer loses great security. All right? <laughs> you, you, you ever seen somebody, you know, they, they got double keys, they got double locks, they got a dog on top of it, and then they might even have a security guard, leave lights on. You know, when you lose faith, uh, you are a, uh, let me use street language, you're a scourge, okay? <laughs> you, you become a scaredy cat, you know, because you've lost faith in everything. All right, so when, 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 you, when the faith in Christ is gone, the human sufferer loses great security. All right, let me give you the fifth one. When you lose that faith in Christ now, that faith in God, even that faith in the Holy Spirit, the writings of the Holy Spirit, then the human mortal loses great hope. Let me say something to you, class. When you lose hope, you're in a very dangerous, vulnerable position when you lose hope. So when the faith in Christ is gone, the human mortal loses hope. And that is the key to suicide. When you become hopeless, you set up yourself for suicide. So now let, let, me, let, let me go to another phase here and share with you the action of faith, the New Testament faith, on the human life. What does, what is the result of having faith do for the human? I think there, I'm going to give you about uh, uh, seven areas where faith works on the human. Number one, when, when you have this uh, New Testament faith. The action that takes place, number one is, you will stand by faith. In other words, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. So you'll stand by faith. All right, uh, now, a passage of Scripture you could use would be 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians. Now that's 1 Corinthians, and then there's 2 Corinthians. I believe the former president called it 2 Corinthians. That shows he's not really familiar with Holy Writ, though he wants to pretend that he is. See, you can't lie about the Bible. When you start lying about the Bible, people like me are going to challenge you on that. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 24. You stand by faith. That's, that's an act that, that you, you stand, and, and faith will be the reason that you stand. Uh, and that, that, that will be the impact on your life as a human. All right. Obviously, if you stand by faith, then uh, when you you will also walk by faith. All right. Again, in Second Corinthians chapter five and verse seven, we walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, we walk by what we don't necessarily see because we are relying on Christ to guide us and protect us. Uh, e even when I deposit my money into the church treasury. I'm giving it because I have faith in Christ that it's going to benefit the kingdom of Christ in some way. All right? So we walk by faith. What else? Well, the axiom of faith on the human life is we endure by faith. Let's, let's for a moment flip over to the book of Hebrews. All right? Hebrews, James. Right before James is the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. I like, ch I love chapter, I think we all love chapter 11 because faith is defined in chapter 11. And Romans chapter 10 tells you how you get it. All right. But in chapter 11 of Hebrews and verse 27, let's go to verse 27. All right. In verse number 27, it talks about uh, how that, uh, it's really dealing with Moses, okay? And, and, and it says that uh, by faith, now watch this now. I'm going to give you, you got it now? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. By faith, he, that's Moses, he is the antecedent of Moses. 
You notice up in verse 24, the, the discussion on Moses began where it says, By faith, Moses, in verse 24, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You know, he grew up in Egypt, but because he had faith in the Godhead, he refused Pharaoh's instruction and Pharaoh's doctrine and Pharaoh's lifestyle, okay? But in verse 27, by faith, he even forsook Egypt. He left Egypt. Uh, not fearing the wrath of the king. In other words, when you get the faith of God and the faith of Christ and the faith of the Holy Spirit, you will not fear the government, all right? You won't fear the government. So by faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath or the anger of the king, for he endured, all right? So when you get this New Testament faith, working in you, you will endure as seeing him who is invisible. In other words, you will endure because you know Christ is the protective shield around you, okay? Now, since we're in Hebrews, let, let, let's, let, let's see another impact that this New Testament has on our lives. Let's look at verse 33. Go down to verse 33. Now, in verse 32, you find that several people were mentioned who had this God-based faith. There was Gideon, there was Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel. They are all named in verse 32, okay? But verse 33 uh, it, it, it is the conclusion of that thought where it says, who, these men, who through faith did what? They subdued it kingdoms. In other words, so in other words, this, 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 this Bible-based faith in the Godhead will enable you to subdue. They subdued kingdoms. They wrought righteousness. Notice it didn't say right now. It said righteousness. Obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions. Ah, if we go on to verse 34, they quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed vi valiant in fight, and turned to flight the armies of the aliens, the enemies, okay? All right, so you are able to subdue. All right, let me give you a fifth one. When you have this faith that Christ offers, you, 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 you're able to fight by faith. You fight by faith. In other words, you, 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 don't, you don't fight by when you, when you have the Christ faith, you fight the way Christ would fight. Now you don't get a gun and start shooting somebody. So that, that's why these Christian nationalists, they, they do not want it, they do not support gun laws. You know why they do not support gun laws? Because they have fear. And why do they have fear? Because they do not have the faith in Christ that they claim to have. Because you claim it does not mean that you have it. Okay? And then consequently they get doubt, disbelief, and distrust. And so then they load their houses up with guns in order to protect themselves. And those guns will not protect them when you have fear on the inside of you as a person. All right? So then the Hebrew writer says that they, uh, th th that this faith, they were able to uh, 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 fight uh, by faith, uh, that the faith that the Lord had. I'm going to give you a passage of there, which would be 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 would be a good one. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. We're not going to read that, but you can read that on your own. Let me, let me give you number 6. Number 6, the action of faith on the human life is triumphant. You, you, you triumph by faith. You, you, you're a winner when you have faith. Ah, that's why uh, the Apostle Paul was a winner by faith. When he was shipwrecked, he still made it to Rome. He was a winner by faith. Christ even was a winner by faith. The apostles were winners by faith. Moses was a winner by faith. And finally, I'll give you number seven. Write this one down. Your achievement, whatever you achieve, 
is proportional to your faith. Okay? Your achievement. Now, let me say that again now. Whatever you accomplish, your achievement is proportional to your faith. And that's New Testament faith. Proportional. Well, how about you have a, have a scripture? Well, let's, let's, let's go to one. Let's go back in Mark. Let's go back to the book of Mark. The second book in the New Testament. Mark, I believe it's the one I want. I think it's the one I want. Mark chapter 9. I'm going to give you time to flip back there. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 9. That's the first book of the New Testament. I, 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 mix, I won't mix you up like that. But Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 9, and let's see, I believe it's verse 29. All righty, uh, we'll find that uh, there were some blind men. There was a blind man. Uh, let, let's look at verse 28 to help us set this up. Okay, in the ninth chapter of Matthew, it says uh, in verse 28, And when he was come into the house, that's Jesus, the blind men came to him. The blind men came to him. Blind men, physically, they couldn't see. And Jesus said unto them, and he, he asked a question. Now watch the question now. Believe ye that I am able to do this? That I'm able to heal the blind? They said unto him, Yes, Lord, you're able. Now watch this now. Watch verse 29 now. Then touched he their eyes, saying, Now watch, watch the next phrase now. You see, when you read the Bible, you want to read it closely like you read everything else, see. Read the Bible closely. According to your faith. Now watch this. What did I just say? Your achievement in life is proportional to your New Testament faith. If you have little faith, you'll have little achievement. All right? That's, that's very, very, very basic. Small faith, small results. Big faith, big result. Your achievement is proportional to your faith. Oh, Lord have mercy. I'll never forget when we were starting to build our building, you know. Uh, I had to encourage the people, your achievement is proportional to that New Testament faith that you have. If you, if, if you think like a $1,000 person, you get a $1,000 result. All right? That's, that's what it boils down to. If, if you go into a class in, 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 in high school or in college and you think like a C student, that's about what you will achieve. You think like a D student, that's what you achieve. If you go in there thinking like an A student, that's what you will work to achieve is an A student. All right? So Jesus said, according, in verse 29, now watch this now, according to your faith, men, be it unto you. And watch this, in verse 30 it says, and their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, see that no man know it. You know, now, you know sometimes, you know, when you get a blessing, you don't have to tell everybody your blessing. Just tell them that you had faith in Jesus. How Jesus did it, I can't explain how he does it, okay? Now, let, 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 as we continue this, this study of, of trying to deal with doubt, the three Ds, doubt, disbelief, and distrust, let me give you some biblical concepts that we, we need to surrender our life to as personal convictions. In other words, there are some personal convictions 
that we must surrender to. You know, you know the word surrender means I, I just give up. I hold up my hands. I give up. I give up. You need to give up certain things in order to deal with doubt, the three Ds, doubt, disbelief, and distrust. All right? I'm, I'm going to give you about seven or eight of these, okay, that, that you need to surrender to. All right? Uh, no, no, number one uh, is you, you need to believe that the Godhead is. Believe that God is. Believe that Christ is. Believe that the Holy Spirit is. Uh, we, we, we just read uh, John chapter 14 and verse 1, our text, and you can read the rest of those verses because Jesus even said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man gets to the Father except by me. You can't even get to God unless you go through Jesus. He said, then he also said, I go away and prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So in other words, you got to believe that God is, that Jesus is, and that the Holy Spirit is. All right? That's the concept. That's the concept. That's the concept that you need to surrender your life to. All right? Let me give you another one. You need to believe that Christ is the Son of God. Believe that He is the Son of God. And He is the Savior. Uh, I'll give you a passage of Scripture for that. It will be 1 John chapter 4 and verse 14. 1 John. Now, we, we were reading in the Gospel of John, but now in 1 John, the Epistle of John, letters that John, John wrote 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. In 1 John chapter 4, uh, verse 14, believe that Christ is the Son and the Savior. That's a concept you need to believe, okay? You, you, you know, see, some things you just believe when it comes to Christ, you know, don't try to explain it, okay? See, right now, you can't even explain how your stomach works, but it does. I tell you one thing, you don't put any food in it, it'll tell you that you, 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 you need some food, okay? So there are many things we cannot explain. You, we, we, can't, we, we really can't explain how a transformer works. You know, you know, when the power company sends out power at 115,000 volts and it's transformed down to 120 volts for your house, we can't explain how a transformer works. We can't really explain how bones grow in the womb. We can't explain how a black cow can eat green grass, produce white milk, and produce and, and yellow butter. We can't explain it, but it happens. We can't explain how the rainbow appears in the sky. We can't explain it, but we see it. So some concepts you have to just believe because God is, Christ is, and the Holy Spirit is. All right? Let me give you a third concept that you need to uh, uh, to to surrender to surrender to, and that is believe the ins that the inspired word. Now watch this now, that the inspired word of the Bible is only is the only inerrant guide is the only guide that has no errors for life and heaven to guide our lives and for heaven. I think I better, I better give you a passage of Scripture for that one. All right, let's go to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. You know, there's 1 Timothy, and then there is 2 Timothy. All right? All right, let's go to 2 Timothy for just a moment. Chapter 3, verses, uh, let's see here, verses 16. Uh, yeah, 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verses 16. Uh, and 17. <clears throat> All right, everybody ready? All right, this is very important, okay? Now watch this now. Now you, you, you need to give up your life, surrender your life to these concepts. Here's a concept you need to, to surrender to, and that is the inspired word is the inerrant guide for our life and for heaven, okay? Now what does he say in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses, this is Paul, writing to uh, his son in the gospel, Timothy. Paul is inspired to write this, by the way. Paul is not writing out of opinion. 
He's not writing out of philosophy, not writing out of what mommy told me or grandmother told me or, or what, my, what, what, what my preacher told me. He's writing of what Christ told him to write. What did he, what did he write in verse 16? All Scripture, not some, but all Scripture is given by what? Inspira I've been saying that all along. All Scripture is given by inspiration of who? Of God. And is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in being right? No, in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God, that's the, that, that's the minister, Timothy. That's the minister. See, we got a lot of ministers that, that do not meet this, 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 this qualification. That the man of God, the man of God is the minister, the one who is ordained by the Lord, sanctioned by a consensus of the members within a congregation of the church of Christ. All right? That the man of God may be perfect, that means mature, thoroughly furnished or equipped unto all good works. Got that? All right, okay, all right, hopefully you got that, all right? Now let me give you another concept that you need to accept and you need to believe. So just surrender, just surrender, okay? All right, what is that concept here? Well, believe that Christ has one church and salvation only is in it, and I am a member of it. You need, you, you need, you need to reach that concept that Christ only built one church, Salvation is in the one church, and that I'm a member of it. Everybody got that? Matthew 16, 18, Christ said, up on this rock, I will build my church. Now, notice something. Christ didn't say, I'm going to go out and get some contractors to help me to build this church. He didn't go out and say, I'm going I'm I'm to get, get Joseph and Mary to help me build this church. He didn't go out and say, I'm going to get John and James to help me build this church. He didn't go and say, I'm going to, I'm going to call Moses from the grave to help me build this church. No, Christ said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hell will have no power over my church. Hell uh, refers to Hades, and you know, so in other words, the grave and death nor sin will have an impact on the church that Christ built. All right? And then uh, you can also uh, check it out in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 23. So that's, that's a concept. All right, let me give you the fifth concept. That uh, must you must surrender your life to in order for this New Testament faith to work in your life that Christ faith. That is, believe there is a heaven uh, to seek, a hell to shun, and a heaven by selection. All right? Let me say that again. There, 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 there is a heaven to seek, a hell to stay away from or shun, and a heaven, and heaven is my selection. You need you, that, that's a concept you need to buy into. See, a lot, lot of people, lot of a lot, there are a lot of people that no, you know, there's some people that believe that there is heaven, but there's no hell. Okay, now let, let me tell you something. There's always a type and an anti-type. Whenever you have a winner, there is a loser. When you take your hard-earned money and you go into a casino and you lose it, somebody else will win it. When you win, somebody else loses. When you go to an NFL game, we're getting ready for the Super Bowl, somebody will win and somebody has to lose. When you get into politics, somebody wins former president and somebody loses. We got, we got a former president, he, he's trying to run again and he's already said, if I don't win, it's, it's rigged, it's fixed. No, it doesn't work that way, sir. 
we, we're about the same age. I'm 78, and you're about 78 years old, too. Okay. Either you win or you lose. How do you win? Get more votes than the other person. If your vote total is less, don't cheat and steal and say somebody took your vote. You just didn't get them. That's all. You just didn't get it. Accept that fact. See, some things you have to surrender to. You have to surrender. Okay. Let me give you number six. Believe, this is a concept that you need to surrender to, that my real purpose is to glorify the Godhead. This, this is something that we need to teach a lot of people, that my purpose on earth is to glorify the Godhead. If you call yourself a New Testament Christian, your purpose is to glorify God. I believe Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. In other words, in other words make God look good, okay? That's the job of a Christian. You, you obey Christ and that makes God look good. When you disobey Christ, that makes God look bad. All right? You got that? All right, let me give you number seven. Let me give you number seven. All right, another concept that you need to surrender to is to believe in the inherent goodness of humans and good will triumph. Let me repeat that again. Let me, let me pick somebody who is, is dead and passed on. Let's, let's, let's pick, uh, uh, let's see here. Mm, let's see here. Let's, let's pick uh, Al Capone. Al Capone. He was a professional criminal. But you know, there was some good in Al Capone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's inherent good in all Okay? Let's take Adam and Eve. There was inherent good in Adam and Eve. They both sinned, and they both were evicted from their paradise, but there was an inherent good in them. So let's put it this way. There is some good in the worst of us, and there is some bad in the best of us. But I like to focus on the positive side that there is inherent goodness in humans and the good will triumph. In other words, even when you take a bad person, I, 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 there have been people who said they don't even believe in God, but you let them get on their deathbed, they'll start saying, my God, my God. There is goodness and goodness will triumph in all human beings, okay? And then I'm going to give you number eight now as we, as, we, as we move toward our conclusion in this lesson. We need to believe that the God head hears righteous prayer. When the righteous pray, see, God doesn't hear sinners pray. In other words, God doesn't respond to a sinner's prayer. What God responds to is that when a sinner when a sinner's praying, what you need to do is, 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 is get rid of your sin. You get rid of your sin by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and being baptized to wash away your sin. Baptism remits your sin. That's what, that's what the book says. That's, that, that's the plan. Remits your sin. Baptism does. Right teaching, baptism, remits sin. Let's say that again now. Right, righteous teaching, baptism, remits sin. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be there. Okay? All right. So when you, when, you, uh, when you pray, believe the Godhead, believe what the Godhead can provide for you. Believe that the Godhead is the providence will fulfill, that the providence of the Godhead will fulfill. And believe that the Godhead will meet every promise. See, the Godhead makes promises to us, and they will be met. The Godhead is providence to us, provides for us. 
And the Godhead not only provides, the Godhead will fulfill that which is promised. All right? Now, let's look at three areas as we try to close this lesson out, three or four areas that, and, and like this. But there's, there's three faiths, that, that three, there's three ways that our, our faith needs to be directed. Number one, we need faith in the Godhead. Write that down, class. Number two, you need faith in others. And number three, you need faith in yourself. And then, and finally, you need to have faith that you are that you are saved by Christ. Okay, those are four faiths that you need. There's four. That, that's the four manifestations of New Testament. There's only one faith, but the manifestation of the faith is. It should be manifested such that you have faith in God, you have faith in others, and you have faith in yourself, and you have faith that you're saved. Okay? Let's talk about each one of them right quick, right quick. Faith in the Godhead. Okay? Number one, what about the Godhead should I have faith in? Well, the person of the God. See, the person of God. God is a personality. The providence of God. I should have faith in the providence of God. I should have faith in the promises of God. I should have faith in the power of God. I should have faith in the presence of God. And I should have faith in the precepts of God. Okay? That's, that's how my faith should work when it comes to the God here. All right? Let's talk about others now. What about faith in others? How do I get that in place? Well, Christ had faith in others. How do you know that? When he gave the great commission, he told his apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth that is baptized shall... So in other words, he had faith that they would do it. Okay? So you got to have faith in others. When we, when we work in the church, you can't work in the church. I'm going to do it all by myself when you don't know what you're talking about, don't know what you're doing. You got to learn to have faith in others who may know more than you know. Okay? In our recent succession, in the, we're here at North Shore. But I'm now a minister emeritus. I had to place faith in a young man that he can do the job. You know, you got to put faith in others. All right, Christ did. Uh, Barnabas did. In Acts, he put faith in the Apostle Paul. Uh, love will result in faith in others. In other words, when you when you put faith in others. That's how love is generated. You know, people are always talking about, well, I, I love you, I love you, but you don't have faith in them. Now, you, you, can't, you can't love somebody that you don't have faith in them, okay? Ministers, elders, deacons, and members, in general, you got to have faith in others, okay? And now, now what, what about yourself? Well, I, I must put that in place, that I have faith in myself. Paul did. Nehemiah did. Nehemiah had faith in himself. Uh, Joshua and Caleb, they had faith in themselves. Joshua said, Caleb said, give me this mountain. You know, Caleb could have asked for the fertile soil of the valley, but he said, no, give me this mountain. I want a mountain. Joshua, what did Joshua say? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In fact, Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve, people, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay? And then finally, the faith that I am saved. The Spirit bearing witness with my spirit. In other words, the, the Holy Spirit must coincide with my spirit. See, we all have a spirit. Yes, Yes, as human beings, we have evil, you know, spirit is life. Life is spirit, okay? So we have evil in us. So we, what we have to do is reduce the evilness and increase the righteousness. And the more we increase the righteousness, the Holy Spirit begins to coincide with our spirit. Got that? All right. The Lord has no respect of person. In other words, I don't care whether you're black, you can be saved. If you're white, you can be saved. There's no black supremacy and there's no white supremacy. There is God's 
supremacy. And the Lord handles the, sal the saving salvation. He has no respect of person. Uh, Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Cornelius was a Gentile, and the Gentiles received the same salvation that the Jews received. They had to hear the word, believe it, and be baptized to wash away their sin. The Godhead cannot lie. All right, when the Godhead says it, it means it, and it will be done. Let, let, let's conclude. Let's conclude now. I'm ready to conclude. I'm going to conclude. Let's go to the last book in the Bible. Ready, class? You've been a wonderful class now as we're dealing with these three Ds, dealing with doubt, ah, disbelief, and distrust. Now let's, let, let, let's close out. I'm going to give you a verse that I want you to hang your hat on. Uh, in, in Revelation chapter 21, the last book in the New Testament, and verse number 8. Verse number 8. You ready? Now, Jesus is communicating this to the apostle John on the Isle of Patmos. And this is what John writes. This is what John writes. Jesus told him. He says this, but the fearful. Everybody got that? You know, we, we talked about, the, you know, the foundation of fear. The foundation of fear is, 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 is tied into this doubt. He said, the fearful. Now watch the next one now. And the unbelieving, see, that's, that, that's the faithless, unbelieving, all right? Then he goes on to say, the abominable, some people are just abominable, just, just bad rascals. Then what? The murderers. You don't have to just murder somebody with a gun or, you know, hit them over the head with a hammer. You can murder them by your tongue, okay, the murderers. And what? Whoremongers. All right, what else? Sorcerers. What else? Idolaters. You know, you know, we all, there's an idol we all have. There's an idol that we all have. Let me hold it up. I'm going to hold it up. Let me hold it up. This is an idol that we all have. This is an idol we all have called a cell phone. You don't want to lose it. It's a, it has become an idol. And it, 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 is, it is actually hurting our nation because on this, this is where you hook it into the social network. And the social network, you don't know where it's coming from. And this is why we're having so much disruption in our society and in our political processes. Because everybody can communicate on this thing. This has become an idol. Okay. Now he goes on to say, the uh, an idol, idolaters. And then watch this next one now. All liars. Okay? That's big lies, small lies. That's white lies. That's unintended lies. All liars. Now, what's the result, Jesus? What's the result? Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Your first death is when you go to the cemetery. And then you'll be resurrected. And the second death is if you go to hell. How can you avoid get going to hell? Jesus said, up on this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. you got to get in the church, stay in the church, obey the teachings of the Lord's church, the church of Christ, and God will bless you. May God bless you. Let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this particular lesson and these students who have taken the time to listen and to study and record information. We pray that their lives will be better because of it, and they will begin to respond for a message that will make them stronger in managing the three tragic Ds, managing doubt, managing disbelief, and managing distrust. They need that New Testament faith. These blessings we ask in the name of Jesus, who has the faith. In his name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. May God bless all of you, and we'll see you next time. Change me, how he saved me. Oh Lord, I'm a living testimony. I can't keep it to myself. I'm gonna tell everybody how he saved me. Separated, sanctified. 
I've been bought with the price, paid by the blood of the Lamb. So for him I live a Christian life, sometimes despise for the cause, yet still I call. Thinking about how you brought me through, use me Lord, I'm here for you, testify. 